The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there, everybody. I want to welcome, welcome you to a webinar called, oh my god, just a minute. No, it's not called, oh my god. Let me see why I'm not showing my screen. Okay, don't we love technical issues. Anyway, my name is Valora Hammond, and I am going to go ahead and be presenting um, this Corel experience, and I decided to call it Corel My Heart. Let me see again if it won't show my desktop. Okay, there we go. All right, we are going to explore Corel. I have taught three or four different projects by using Corel, and every time I present it, I get more and more excited about what Corel can bring to my digitizing. So I hope that you get as excited about Corel as I do. I am kind of, I've been around doing digitizing for um, what I think a really long time. It's probably all relative compared to the dinosaurs, but um, the embroidery has really changed in the last few years. It's gotten to be lighter and not just a big mass of, of stitches. So this I actually am really excited about. Um, many of you guys don't know me, but I'm a very much a one and done type of person. So I did one of these. I liked it so well, I created three more others, all done in sort of a monotone, um, beiges, a little bit of rust, browns, very soothing colors. But I liked it so much, I turned around and did them in all red. And I can see it done in red and green for Christmas, obviously red for Valentine's Day, red and blue for um, the summer season, maybe deeper fall colors. Hearts are pretty much a universal sign and they go all year round. So anytime you decorate with hearts, it's obviously because we've given you a piece of our heart. All right. So this is what the graphic or what the embroidery is going to look like. And we will be building this. Obviously those of you um, that know me, I digitize I am one of those, I want to get it done, and then I tweak for the colors. So a lot of times when, when I'm digitizing a design, I don't care what the colors are because I'm going to mix that up depending upon, obviously with this one, what season I'm going to be making it for, what the color scheme in my bedroom, living room, patio, porch, whatever it's going to be because there are no color cops in the sewing machine. So um, when I design and when I digitize, I just I just go for it. So I hope you guys get as excited about this as what I do. This again is the design that we will be creating. I do do stippling around it so that we have some quilting along the way. And so the machine accessories you're going to need, you're obviously going to need the embroidery foot P. We will be doing some lines of decorative stitches, and the border guide foot is awesome about that. We will be needing to cord down some serger floss or decorative threads. We also add some beading. I mean, I know I got a lot of stuff in this, but detail is the difference between a coal a jacket from a midline store and a jacket from a boutique store. It's all about the little details that you add that really make an, a, a project come together. We will be putting in a zipper, so we will be needing the zipper foot. My favorite zipper foot is the narrow base zipper foot. It is the one I, I grew up with. It's the one that's got the screw in the back that you can then slide the foot to one side or the other. Absolutely love it. I love it for sewing on uh, getting really close to piping. I love it for sewing down ribbon that has beads to it because I can get really close to that edge of that ribbon. The other foot we're going to be using is the satin stitch foot because we are going to be exploring the variable width zigzag which is a unique feature that we have on the 15,000 and on another machine that we will be coming out. But I believe the variable width zigzag is an exclusive to the Janome brand. All right, I know we got a lot of feet, but we've got a lot of really nice detail in this um, quilt. What we're going to need, we're going to need some poly mesh cutaway. 
whenever I do a, an entire block like this, I always like to leave the entire block backed with a stabilizer. Polymesh is great for this because it really doesn't have a stiffness to it. And FYI, this is not on your um, instruction sheets. I sort of think when I'm doing embroidery, I sort of forget that I have to put down stabilizer because it's such just a given. We will be using the AccuFeed quarter inch foot. You will also be able to use a regular quarter inch foot. And uh, the two or five spool thread stand is awesome to have back on your machine. Some of the standard accessories you're going to need, I always use pre-wound bobbins for any of my embroidery. This design will fit in the square 23 hoop, the red tip needle for embroidery and regular sewing. I think that's all the supplies you're going to be needing to complete this other than your thread. So let's talk about the thread. Again, I love the artistic metallic thread. It just is such a nice sheen. I don't have any problem stitching it out. And a little bit of glitz, a little bit of a gold metallic, really just kind of adds that richness to a project. Again, the Janome polyester embroidery thread, I, ha I love it. But if you guys have it, that's fine. If not, thread of your choice. You guys know that. Uh, monofilament thread. I use the monofilament for sewing down my beaded trim. So I found a really great source of beaded trim. It comes on a strand. It's not. It's a bunch of tiny um, seed beads on a string. So it's not it's again it's a little bit more subtle than if it was just a row of beads. I found it at one of the hobby stores and serger floss or a thick thread such as Razzle Dazzle. This will be used with the cording foot which is an awesome effect to add some dimension to the top of a project. Okay, let's see what other supplies we're going to need. We're not going to need any more. So we are ready to get going on the actual design. Like I said, I did this in red and I wanted to show you the picture. I actually set this one on point also so that you can see a little bit of the a little bit more detail because the other ones were stitched out in a very tonal effect that you may not have seen the detail in the beginning snapshot. So this is the red one. Like I said, awesome effects and I'll show you some of the play arounds and how you can have fun with this. So are we ready to go? Let me see if there's any comments along the way. Uh, let me see how I can figure that one out. So far, I don't see any, any questions. So let me go ahead and close that area. Let me go back into digitizing. All right. You're going to open up Easy Design. And once you're in Easy Design, you're going to open up a sheet if it doesn't come up to the, the screen. Once we're here, we're first just going to go right into Corel. So that's going to be the switch to graphics mode. It's going to be the pencil. I hope everybody sees where I'm at. Right there's the pencil on my screen. Your screen might be in another location, but the pencil will always allow you to switch to the graphic mode. Once you're in the graphic mode, let's talk about what we see. I know we've approached Corel in a couple of different projects along the way when we're creating a basic shape or something, but this square or rectangle that you see in the middle, that actually represents a page of uh, an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. Corel is used a lot of times for building brochures, newsletters, stuff like that. So they give you your parameters to start with. It actually works great when you're looking for proportion. You know, when I it's eight and a half wide, I know our largest hoop is nine. So I know I can create a design or a, a Corel object that's within this sheet of paper and it pretty much will fit into either the square 23 or the GR hoop. So that gives me the information I need to be sort of within the parameters that I need once I get into digitizer. All right, so we've got that blank sheet of paper. What are we going to do with it? Well, first thing we're going to do with it is we're going to go to vector shapes. That's going to be this one over here where it says the where you see the rect uh, the square, the circle and the triangle. Once you click that, you will get another 
toolbar up front that has perfect shapes. We don't have to be perfect, we can, but we can draw perfect shapes. Once you click on that, these perfect shapes come up and become available. And you can choose what you want to do with those, and you can morph them from there. We're going to go with the heart. All right, once we do that, we're going to go in here. The heart has been selected. Once I click, it activates my tool. So once the tool is activated, then all I have to do is left click and drag my shape. Once I release it, it goes away. Now yours may not be filled. What it shows is all of these colors over here are the fill or the line. And so if we click on the big X up here, it will, and I right, I left click, you left click for a fill, you right click for the outline. So I just removed it by doing the eraser right over there. And once that eraser is there, we've got that shape here, we're ready to go. What are we going to do with it? Well, the first thing we're going to do with it, we're going to make it the size that we want. So as long as it's got the handles around it, we know it's been selected. I want this to be six by six. Now my little lock right here is turned off or it's unlocked so that I have to change each one, each link, height and width independent. Otherwise, if it was locked on, it would change them all proportionately. But I know I want it six by six. I'm going to hit enter. That's my original, or that's my shape I want. So I've got that. Now I need to make the outline slightly heavier. If I go across here, you will see a nib of a pencil, and that is my outline. I'm going to change that to a four. Once it's changed to a four, then I know I will be able to find it, research it, get it, what I need to do with it. So once that's there, we're going to change the color. And we, I like to change the color because a lot of what we're going to be doing is going to be coming in as black and white. And I don't want the outline to be conjoined with the design that we're going to be putting on the inside. So we're going to go over here and you're going to choose a color you normally don't use. Uh, I think the instruction sheet says blue and we might go with orange. So whatever color you normally won't use. So let's go. So you're going to right click, see how it changes the outline to the blue. That is a right click will change the outline. Okay, let's see if there's any questions. Awesome, there's not any questions so far. That is great. Okay, so once we have that, now what are we going to do with it? Well, this is where the fun gets started. We're going to go back over here and above the basic vector shapes, you're going to see a shape. Generally, if you haven't used it, it's going to be a rectangle. So we're going to left click and drag out to the right till we see all of these other shapes in here. We're just going to choose the oval. And once we choose the oval, you see now that my pointer has become activated as a drawing tool. You see the little oval is, select, is hooked to my pointer. All I have to do is left click and drag a shape. And once I do that, I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to select it. I'm going to change it to be six inches wide by four inches high. Now it really doesn't mean that it has to be that big, but I kind of like to have it that big because we're working within that six by six heart. So once we have that, we're going to click on that again. I actually want to make that outline black. So I'm going to go over here and again I'm going to right click, oops, I left click, let me erase that. I right click on that outline and I'm going to make that also a point four. All right, so now I've got two heavy outlines. The rotating tools become available so I can go in and I can rotate this any way I want. All right, this is where your creativity will begin. We're going to divide that original heart into four different sections by using this oval.
Now, yeah, we could have drawn straight lines, but straight lines are kind of boring. So we're just going to go ahead and we're going to select that and we're going to left click and drag it. Now, okay, oops. All right, I'm not sure what happened there. Let me start over again. You can see how quickly you can go from that design to something else. All right, let's go back into our smart shapes, select our heart, going to activate left click and drag. Once I left click and drag, I'm going to make that heart six by six. Oh, now that's a panic. I'm sorry if I freaked out a little bit. All right, once we have that, we're going to change the outline color. So I'm going to right click, going to change the width. This is just a refresher of what we've already done. All right, let me see. I'm not, okay, never mind. I, I wasn't seeing the webinar people, and I really do want to make sure you guys are available to watch this. So there's my heart again. I'm going to go back up to my oval. I'm going to left click and drag an oval. I'm going to make it six by four. Now these measurements don't have anything really to do with a final shape. It's just that I found that the size worked well for what I was wanting to do with it. So there, I'm going to make the outline black. I'm going to change that also to a four. And so once I have that, I'm going to click on it again until my rotation buttons come available. And I'm going to rotate it. And now I'm going to click on it. Now I'm going to move it. I'm just going to move it so that it just comes down at that point of that heart and comes on around. So this is going to be one shape. Okay. Now this is sort of where the magic begins. So we've got two overlapping shapes. What I want to do is I want to separate this section from that heart so that I can make that another object, another color. I can put things in it, that kind of stuff. So once I'm going to do that, I'm going to go to Arrange and Shaping and Shaping. So when that happens, I get this little window over here in Shaping. So now when I'm shaping, these are my options I can do. I can weld, I can trim, I can intersect, I can simplify, I can do front minus back, and back minus front. So you can play around with all those, those features and see what is going to work for you. I found out that for this project, we're going to intersect. And once we intersect, we need to leave both the source object and the target object clicked on. Okay? So we're going to do that. So what we have to do now is select this. Now we're going to tell it what to intersect with. So we've got our object. We're going to tell it to intersect with. And now you have to actually click on that outline. So that's why I made that outline a little bit heavier. Once you go in and you click right on that outline, notice how those select boxes are pretty small. Well, what they've done is they've segregated this out from the rest of the heart. So once you have that, you're going to go and do a left click on a color. See how it colored just the inside of that part of that heart? That means we've separated it out from the other. Okay. Easy peasy, right? What we're going to do now is we're going to select that oval again, and now we're going to move it to the other side. And now this side I'm going to just kind of look and see how I'm going to want to divide it. So I'm going to bring that oval up here. I'm actually going to rotate it a little bit so that we get a couple of different angles of that curve going on. I'm going to move it on down. Once we have it there, we're going to do the same process. I'm going to select the oval. It's got the rotation. There we go. We're going to tell it to intersect with, and we're going to touch the outline of that heart, and then we're going to come over here, and we're going to left click to fill that area in. All right. One more time, we're going to select that oval. We're going to bring it down. We're going to select it. We're going to rotate it. Another little odd shape. There we go. Select it again, move it on down. All right, we've got that. We're going to again select it. We're going to tell it to intersect with. 
again we're going to touch that outline and now we're going to go in and we're going to left click on a color there we go we've got it we're going to select that oval and we're going to delete it because we don't need it anymore because we can go down here and actually that heart is still underneath there but that's okay we don't we're not going to be worried about it we're going to go over here and we're going to left click and fill that area in all right so now we've taken that heart and we've subdivided it into four different sections let me see if there's any questions so far I love giving these webinars and there are no questions so we're good all right so let me close that window. You guys don't see that window, but it is up there for me so that I can interact with you guys as you've got questions. Now this is going to be where the fun begins. All right, where do we go to find some of these graphics that will allow us to really play and lighten this embroidery design? Because if we were to turn these into stitches, they would just be blobs of stitches. But we want something more. We want to make it more interesting. So what we're going to do is we're going to select that first green part, shows up down here what we have. We're going to go to this bucket. Once we go to this bucket and open it up, we've got options. We've got our uniform fill, which is what we work in normally. We've got a fountain fill. We have a pattern fill. We have a texture fill. We have none and we have Docker windows. We're not we're going to ignore those last 3. Just basically because I the texture fills really only work in print. I really haven't played with them enough to be happy with the effect that I get when I'm doing embroidery because really in embroidery we already are working with texture and three dimension because we are working with thread on fabric. So the first thing we're going to explore is fountain. Once we select fountain this is going to be the information it gives us. What does all of this mean, you ask? Well, let me tell you what it is. Now, here's an example of what we've got. Now, the type can be linear, or it could be radial, it could be conical, or it could be square. So it sort of depends upon the effect that you want. Like I said, once this opens, you guys will not stop playing. It opens a whole floodgate of what you can do with this tool. We're going to make it simple today. We're going to keep it linear. Okay. Now once we keep it linear, you see I'm going to put it in sort of my upper left hand corner here. I don't want the lines to go straight up and down. I want it to go back and forth like this. And I realized that my angle to do that was a 50 a 50 degree or a 50 angle. See how it's how the lines or the the shading is going up and down this way. That's what I wanted. Okay? And as you start playing around with this, you will just explore to no ends. You you won't have a family life because you'll be playing. All right. Next thing I want to do is I want to tell it how many steps I need. Right now in that little square off to my right, there's 256 colors there. I'm not going to want to change the thread that much. Okay, I'll tell you that right now. That's not for me. So I'm going to tell it to go down to five. I want five steps. Okay, you see, one, two, three, four, five. Very easy to do. But I want these two outside ones to be bigger in proportion than the others. So my edge pad, I'm going to change to 30. Now this is all a matter of playing around. This is kind of what I wanted to do. So you guys have to do it my way today. But later on, when you're in class or you have an opportunity to really play, play around with those different numbers. I could go down to a 25, and that leaves my center lines a little bit bigger. So play around. That's what this is all about. All right. The next part is going to be what's fun. Right here we told it that we want two colors, so it goes from green to white. There's from green to white. But we're going to shake that up a little bit. We're going to tell it to go from a dark navy to a bright red. 
okay? Now those lines in between became pretty muddled still, aren't they? Well now this is a straight line. We could go this way and it will go through all of these colors going around the path clock, uh, counterclockwise or we can go it this way and it will go through all the colors to get to that other side in a clockwise. Well, this is what I chose because if you see here, it goes from blue to teal to green to yellow to red. I get very defined color changes when I do it this way. And really, I don't care what the colors are as long as my software later on will be able to pick up the differences of those colors. Okay. So once I have it, the other thing that's really awesome, guys, check out the presets. There is all sorts of awesome already done presets that is just so cool. The barber pole is really cool, but I wanted to keep it fairly simple. I wanted you guys to explore later on. Once you understand how to do it, it's sort of like you learn how to drive, then you learn how to drive fast. So this is kind of... I want you guys to be driving fast later on. Right now, I'm just teaching you how to drive. Okay, so once we've got that, we're going to go ahead and say OK, and there we have it. We've just created a striped pattern over in this area there. All right, we're ready to change the shapes on the other ones. All right, let's see what we're going to do. We're going to select, what one do I, I'm going to select that one up there. Once I select that one, I'm going to go back down to my fill. And this time, instead of fountain fill, we're going to go to the one that's sort of like marble. So it is called, I don't remember which what that is called, pattern fill. All right. When we're in pattern fill, we have three options up at the top. We have a two color. We have a full color. We have bitmaps. This means in that bitmap, you could bring in your own graphic in order to fill an area if you so choose to. But this time, like I said, I'm going to keep it simple. We're just going to go with the two color. Once we choose that two color, we have this drop down window. Once we have that drop down window, look at all the designs that we have here. What is also awesome about those designs, if you click off of it, you see create you could actually create your own shapes or your own designs. That's what I did toward the end of those. Down here, I started playing. All of these were my own designs that I brought in from our uh, clip art. I just squiggled and did some little worms for a stippling. I did some loop-de-loops. I did some squares in a square. So really, you can make them anything you want because this will pop up and then you just fill in the holes. But today, we're going to stay with this flower here. Once we select that flower, we can change the front of the design, obviously the black. We're going to save that as black because it's okay. We're going to, we're going to work with it later. But we're going to change the back from white to this light gray. So once it's saved to the light gray, what we're now going to do is change the size of the width and the height. Now this was all very experimental. I played around with it. A lot of it depends on the proportion. The larger the area, the larger the shape can be. So let's go in and say, let's just make this a one by one. Now I've also noticed sometimes when you bring in a bitmap, it is only so big so that it might have to repeat itself so you might get a seam line on an object that you may not like. So at that point you either need to make your original clip art bigger or you need to make the design this part here bigger so that it fills in that area. Once you start playing with it you'll understand as you see the dimensions change. We're not going to change anything with the rows or the column offsets. I'm going to leave those alone and I'm going to say OK. And now we've got that design up there in that corner. That's how easy it is to create these kind of, they're almost then tangle-ish objects inside of your embroidery. All right, that one's done. Let's select the next color. And now we're going to go again into that object fill, into patterns. And this time, we are, let me see, I missed, I turned too many pages. 
we are going to choose full color. Now these little beads on a string, they're like one of my favorite designs. They are so awesome to be able to add that detail without doing the digitizing. So we're going to go there. Again, we're going to say change this size to a 2 by 2 All right, so we're going to go 2 by 2 We're going to leave the color as it is. We're going to be fine. Everything else we're not going to change. Okay, I'm, I'm just trying to think if we ought to rotate it. Should we rotate it? This isn't in the directions, but I want to show you how easy it can be done. We're just going to go ahead and rotate it. Let's rotate it about 50 degrees. Uh, let's go 45, 40, 45. All right. I go OK. Now you'll see those designs. OK, I don't like that. They're almost mimicking that same line there. I don't want that. So let's just undo and let's go back. And let's, we're just going to leave them in straight up and down just because. But you can see that you could rotate them, you can skew them. So we're going to go OK and, oh, I forgot to change the size. That diverted back. So let's go back to 2 by 2. These are all in your handouts about which design I selected and what the settings are. Going to go OK. There's my little per pearls on a string. Last but not least, we select that last shape. We're going to again go into texture, and now we are going to go into, we're going to go back up, but I want to show you what the bitmap is. The bitmaps are sort of just kind of textural-y things that are really hard to interpret into embroidery. So that's why we're not really going to go there, but if you guys are doing letters for your um, church, for PTA, for any group you're in, you can also play around with these textures because Corel was actually made for graphic artists that do other things. So we're going to go back to the two colors. We're going to go down here and we're going to choose this maze. All right, once we choose this maze, we're going to change the color of this. We're going to make it green on the front and we're going to leave the back white. All right. We're going to change the size to, let's see what the size I've got. My area here, uh, I'm going to make it 1.5. The directions say 2, but again, that depends upon the size that you have to fill in that area. So let's go 1.5. Now, I didn't do this here, but I think we should offset the rows by 50%. So it's 50% of the size. So they're going to become like subway tiles. They're going to be set off at the halfway mark. Once we have that, we're going to leave it there. We're going to go OK. See now, instead of stacking up, they're slightly offset. Just that little bit adds that much detail to that heart. We're through. We're through designing. OK? Now let me see if there's any questions. Oh, no chat. Nobody's chatty today. Awesome. All right. Once we have that, we now have to make it so that the software can see it as a graphic. Before, we've always been pretty easy in telling it to go right up here to, let me, okay, let, let me select everything. Go up here, select, convert selected graphics to embroidery. Because these are designs within that heart, the software will not recognize them. So really, once we convert it over to digitizer, you will just get blobs of color, sort of like what we started with. So we've got to do a couple of different steps to this before we can take it into digitizer and um, semi-auto digitize it. So the first thing we have to do, now I know everything is selected because I did edit and select all, we have to turn this into a bitmap, okay? So we're going to tell it to convert to a bitmap. Once we have it there, this anti-aliasing comes on, and I'm going to show you what happens when you leave it on. Okay, so let's leave it on. We're going to go OK, and now what happens, let me get in here, see how many colors it takes to go from white to light blue to teal to this color blue. 
this is where the software wants to change color in through there. We don't want that. Okay, that I guess through the technology or terminology that I've just been exploring, I go back, I'm going to scroll up. See how clean those lines are now? All right. When I go edit, select, go into bitmap, and tell it to convert to, to bitmaps again, I'm going to tick that off. Okay, I don't want it. And now when I say I don't want it and go OK, it becomes pixelated. You see the little stair steps? But there aren't those little box of colors, of different colors that go from one to the other. That is what's going to make this so easy to digitize. Okay? So once we have that, we've got our whole object there. We're ready to go. We're going to tell it to switch to the embroidery mode. We're not going to tell it to convert to stitches because it may have a mind of its own. This is where I start getting to be kind of a control freak. So I'm going to tell it to switch to graphic mode. Once it's there, you're going to go, but it's not there. Where is it? You're wanting to make sure that your picture frame, your display image, is turned on. Once it's turned on, you will be able to see that that image is there. Okay, so here we have it. We've got our design that's six by six. We've got all the detail in it that we need. And like any other bitmap that we work with, we now have to do an image prep. Okay? So once we get ready to do image prep, we're going to look for this icon. Now, I know I do a lot of teaching with the icons, but it is, oh, I'm sorry, not that one. Sorry. This one here, the one with the bird, image prep. There are more than one place to find that. But I do use it on my de on my um, my icons just because it's easy. Once I select that, it's going to say, "How many colors do you want me to change it to?" And I'm going to look around. Okay, this blue is different than my outline. This is different, so I just don't want any of the two colors blending together or connecting. So right there, eight colors is pretty good. Let me see what will happen if I go down to seven. If I go down to seven, oh, see, they took those two colors of green and made them one. That's what you need to look out for. You want to keep as much detail as you desire when you start minimizing your colors. So we need to go back up. That's going to give me my two color choices again there. And we're ready to go. We're going to say, OK. It's going to bring it on in. It's going to give me the differential the differences between all of them. There's my graphic that I'm going to start just totally semi-auto digitizing. You will freak out when you realize how easy this is. All right. So I'm going to go over here, and this is my semi-auto digitizing tool. It might look like an apple. It might have this first icon there. I'm going to grab it and move it out. So did you see how those lines, let me show you again, when I clicked on it, I had those dot, dot, dots right at the very top. When I click on that and left click and hold and drag, I can drag that toolbar out so that it always stays out, so that I'm not always having to go look for it and bring it back in. So it's always going to be available. Now i am just got to go in and digitize it the way I want it. Okay. First off, I know what I'm going to do with this series, so I just need those to be blobs of stitches. I know. Told you we weren't going to work with blobs of stitches, but here we're going to digitize them into blobs. Now when I scroll in, you will see there becomes a cross hatching on the object that it wants to add the stitches to. And that's going to show you what you're resting or hovering over. So we're just going to go blue. Now I've told it to match the palette. So it will match these colors as closely as possible with the Janome colors. So there's my first, there's my second, there's my third, there's my fourth, there's my fifth. Wing ding, I'm done. All right. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to digitize or semi-auto digitize the flowers. I'm going to tell it to do a turning angle satin fill. Okay. Once I have that, I'm just going to scroll in close. I'm going to click, and there it goes. So those are going to be all little satin stitches. I'm going to ignore those two because nobody but you and me will know that they're there. 
all right, go around here, it leaves that hole in the middle of that flower, ding, 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 and now I am done. Let me see if there's one more. Nope, I'm going to ignore that one too. All right, now that graphic is done. I'm going to do the same thing with the pearls on a string. All I do is scroll down, see where my cross hatching is, click on those, and as I go down, actually my program is to do an auto split if the satin stitch is too wide, and I love the fact that it gives that little dimply look to those pearls. And that's what's causing that little dimpled effect is the fact that it's auto splitting. It sees it as being almost too wide to be stable as a satin stitch, so it's adding a couple of stitches to the inside to do that. Now all I have to do is, hmm, what do I want to do? I think I want to keep that turning angle, and now all I have to do is go in and click on each of the green lines, and it will go ahead and do a very nice turning angle stitch around that my maze. Now one of the other things you could do with this is to turn this into an applique. Now I didn't do that this time, but I'm sure that if you are at your dealers and you can say, all right, what do we need to turn this into an applique? They'll be able to walk you through it. Right there. Okay. That is as easy as it gets to create this design. I'm going to turn off the graphic so that you guys can see what we've got already. There we go. We've got it. It's almost done. Now what are we going to do with it? Let me turn my graphic back on. Now I found that when I needed this outline around it, I needed to tell it to click to center line. And that was just a matter of trial and error till I got the effect I want. And again, put my, hash, um, put my mouse over the top of it, click, and it's going to give me one line that goes all around the center. Now I did find that when it came to where these two lines came up, there was a little gap. So we'll go in and change that in the reshape later on. All right. So we have that. We are through digitizing. So I'm going to go ahead and close out that window. And I'm going to select it. And now I'm just going to go in, like I said, I'm going to go in and change those little marks right there. So I'm going to select it. Come on. And go into reshape. And once I'm in reshape, I'm just going to move those on down. And every place where there's going to be one to the other, I'm going to make sure that they all touch. So I'm going to bring that out. Oh, I think that line's already there. I'm going to bring that on down. And a couple more spots. There's one right up here. Now I'm using the, the wheel on my mouse to scroll in close. And there, let's see should be another one right up here. Line continue, so all I have to do is bring this one close. Should be one right over here. Oh, there we go. And right up here. All right, so we're just going to go ahead and move these so that they all join. And that way I know that I'll have a continuous satin stitch all the way around it. All right. So here's our design. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the graphic because I don't need it anymore. And now what are we going to do with this? Well, I'm going to start changing it. I'm going to select this one, which is that first one. I'm going to turn it to red, and I'm going to turn this to red, and I'm going to turn this to red. I'm going to change this to pink. Like I said, I digitize first and then I tweak. All right. So there are my stripes. And now I'm going to play around with those two outside because I want to have a really unusual effect to this. So I'm going to select this one. I'm going to go into Object Details. And when I'm in Object Details, I have it as We Fill 1, Pattern 1. I'm going to change the stitch. Okay, that's a typo on your instructions. It should be your stitch spacing and not your stitch length. Your stitch spacing should be 0.1. You're going to tell it to travel on edge. See how that's going to open it up? I'm going to re oh, travel on edge, and I'm going to remove the underlay. Okay. So what we're going to create is just lines of stitches. See how there's just 
back and forth lines of stitches. That's what a really open weave will look like when you remove the underlay and tell it to travel on the edge. We're going to add an effect to it. We're going to add the Florentine effect. What this is going to allow me to do is change the angle of my stitches. See how it comes out at that bullseye and how it curves? We're going to actually have it curve toward the center. So I'm going to reshape it. You get this line right here. And all I'm going to do is bring it to my baseline that I want it to bullseye out of. And see how it's coming? And a little bit closer. The trick to this is that you cannot do it more than a um, half circle. Um, that's what, 180? If it makes it any closer than a 180, it will revert back to um, the original sh angle. All right. So we're going to leave that like that. We've got that section. We're going to go up here. We're going to select this other section, do the same thing. So we're, we've weave stitch spacing at a point one. So when we've got the, we're going to tell it to travel on edge, and we're going to remove the underlay. All right, we're going to go OK. Now we're going to add that Florentine effect again, but now we've got to reshape it. See this arc here? That is the arc of the Florentine. So all we do is we take our, our nodes, our shaping nodes, and bring them down and shape it. And I kind of wanted it to be sort of like if it was a circle that's been cut in half. That was kind of the effect I was looking for. Oops, see, I changed it too much. All right, let me see what I can do again before it snaps back up. All right, there we go. So see how that looks like it's one piece that's been cut in two and that it will just go from one to the other with that little hesitation in between. That was the effect I was wanting to get. Okay, we're through with that. We're going to go ahead and do our select finger. We're going to choose that middle section, and we're just going to select that. We're going to go into Object Details. We're going to go into a Motif Fill, and we're going to choose Cross 09. Just going to go on up. It's all alphabetical, cross 09. There we have it. We're not going to change anything with the layout. Go OK. So now we've tweaked that. We've got red, 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 pink, pink, with a little interest in between. Everything else is done. That was all we really had to tweak was making those big areas of solid stitches into something else. But now we've got to add some outline detail. All right. I call this the finishing touches. Okay. This point, we're going to select the outline color, which is going to be blue, and we're going to go into object details. We're going to tell it to turn it into a satin line. We're going to make it a point one two. We're going to go OK. And now we've just outlined our object. It really is that easy. All right. But now what we're going to do is we're going to tell it to branch, all right? So that will make it, instead of having to manually path through it and get jump stitches, because if we turned off our visualizer, we would see some jump stitches here. To get rid of those start and stops, we're going to branch it. So we're going to go up to edit, and we're going to tell it to do some branching. Now when we do it, down here in your prompt bar, it says enter entry point. I'm going to choose my entry point. It can be random. It doesn't have to be anywhere. So I'm going to say I'm going to enter here. And now it says enter exit point. I'm going to have it exit at the same location. So I'm going to go exit. Now it just removed all of those jump stitches. So now it will do this in one continuous line traveling through the design as it needs to. That's what branching means. It actually paths its way through so there isn't any jump stitches. So we have that. All right, we've got it. We're ready to go. We want to add a little like lace detail to the outside of that. Oh, I love working with the visualizer on. Let me see if there's any questions. Oh, no questions so far. Awesome. Okay. 
we're going to work and we're going to add some decorative motif stitches around the outside. And it's all of our stitches aren't going to be the same width. That way we can't just do it once and be done with it. So we're going to select the outline and we're going to go into outlines and offsets. Once we're in outlines and offsets, we're going to we don't want an outline, we want an offset. So the first one is going to be an offset of a distance of 0.1. All right. When it's a distance of 0.1, we're going to tell it that we want a motif line. And black is okay because we're going to put it whatever color we want to in it anyway. And we're going to go ahead and say okay. That's going to give us this daisy that always happens to be our default and we just have to select that daisy. Now it puts it to the outside and the inside of our satin line because we told it to do it to the outside. So if we told it to do it to the inside and it was a bigger satin line, it would have attempted to do it on the inside of the satin line. But this way it put it on the outside. We're going to select that. We're going to go into Object Details. And I'm going to show you another way of getting into Object Details. If you right click, you can go into Object Details. So it actually will save you from moving your mouse so much. So once we have that, we're going to go into Motif DES002. Again, it's alphabetical DES002. It just looks like a six-pointed star. So we're going to go OK. Oh, wait, we're going to change the size. Nope, we're not. We're going to leave this one alone. I guess I liked it by itself. There we go. Just a little addition to the outside. We're going to again select our outline and we're going to do an outline and offset. This time we're going to tell it that we're going to go to a 0.3. So now we're at a point three, an offset count of one. We're going to just do a single run line now. So we're going to do a single run line and we're going to leave it in black. We're going to go OK. And now we've got a single run line. Again, we have those to the inside that we need to delete. Only four objects. It's really easy to go in and just delete them. Once we have those deleted, we're going to take that single run line, right click to get to object details. We're going to change it to a candle wicking. So right there's our candle wicking line and they're going to be spread apart. I want mine close together. So we're going to change the candle wicking size to 0.22 and our spacing to 0.22 also. That means that they're going to be right next to each other without a gap in between. So once we have that, we're going to go OK. And now we have that little border of candle wicking around the outside. We're going to choose the outline again. We're going to go into Object Details. This time I'm going to show you another way. Before we were right clicking, this time I'm going to left click twice quickly. So I just left click, click, click and then my object details comes up. Once we're here, we're going to tell it, oops, I didn't need to go into object details. I got ahead of myself. We need to go into outlines and offsets. I'm sorry. So once we're here, we're going to now tell it to do it at a six millimeter distance. Offset of one, single run line, we're going to go OK. Now we've got another line. We're going to go ahead and delete the ones on the inside. And I'm just hitting, um, selecting them and then hitting delete on my keyboard. So I'm going to select this line again. Now I'm going to left click twice. And now I'm going to change it to a motif line. Once I'm in a motif line, I'm going to choose shape. So I'm going to go all the way down to the S's shapes 35. Once that's there, I'm going to change it to 26 by 26, 0.26. 
So there's my design and I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And now I have this lace-like effect running around the outside of my objects. OK, so now we're ready to add a little bit more to the outline. So I'm going to select my outline. And remember when we branched it, oh, wait, we need to do a control D. Duplicate it. This is another keyboard shortcut I like. So we're going to take this, we're going to do a control D. You will see now that you will have two outlines that always adds the last one to the bottom. So we're going to select the bottom one. We're going to have that hammer. We need to break it apart so that we can change it and do other things to it. So we're going to break it apart. We're still going to select it. We're going to turn it yellow. Once we turn it yellow, we're going to go into Object Details. Just a minute. I think we have to do it all that way. When it's broken apart, if I just clicked on it, it would only change that one object. So we're going to go into Object Details. We're going to do it a motif line. We're going to go to Motif 21. So here's Motif 21. It's a ladder stitch. And we're going to go OK. We're going to leave everything the way it was. We're going to go OK. And now you will see we'll just do that ladder stitch right over the satin. Again, just a little bit of added detail. Sometimes that's all it makes to take an object from wow to pow. All right. So there we have our design. Very easy. Now what we need to do is we're going to take the blue outline and move it down one. So that what will happen when it stitches out, it will stitch out all of the black, then it will stitch out the blue and the yellow to like finish it and frost the design. All right. So once we've got that, we're going to now create our ambient quilting. So we're going to choose sort of our four-leaf clover. It's the one down there by the Florentine. We're going to uh, make sure nothing's selected. We're going to go to ambient quilting. Our block size is nine by nine. And we are going to do just a stipple with a design margin of two. I guess I didn't even write that in. Uh, spacing two, one, two, point one, point one, uh, point two, point one, point two. There we go. So the measurements are in there. We're going to go OK. There we have it. We need to also create a stitching line. So the best way and easiest way I found to do a continuous stitching line, the directions say a closed single run line, but I find if I do a box and I hold down control and I left click and drag, I can just drag that box, see how, how it, it's making that box, left click and it will proportionally do it. I go so far, I release, oops, I release something too soon. Let's see, let me go again here, left click, release my mouse, release my um, control button. Now I can select it. Once I do an outline and offset, I choose an outline, a single run line. I choose close my offset. There I get my single run line. I choose that dark blue object. And it might be easier in my object box. There it is. I'm going to hit delete. I now have that blue box. I'm going to go into object details. And I'm sure there are multiple ways of doing this, but I'm going to say it's nine by nine. Go OK. Once it's there, I'm going to tell it to center it in the hoop. Go OK. Oh, I wasn't centered in the hoop, ladies and gentlemen. All right. I need to take this entire design and group it. So I'm going to go Edit, Group. Now I'm going to send it to the middle of the hoop. There we go. I'm going to send this now to the center of my hoop. There we go. There we go. Turn on my hoop. And we are set to stitch. That's in the GR hoop. Let's go in the square 23. There we go. We're ready to stitch it. All right. Let me check one more time if there's any questions. How are we doing on time? 
right at an hour, I wanted to show you some of the other effects, and I'm going to do that anyway. We might be a little bit over an hour today. Let me show you some of the other designs or the samples that I have. These are all designs of um, some of those fills that you were able to pull in. This design was actually kind of fun. I didn't know how it would work out, but I pulled it in, and it was just this little floral design that traced around like a pattern of fabric. You could bring your own fabric in if it was a very clean graphic, very simple. These leaves, I thought, turned out fabulous. I could see all sorts of things with that. Again, this is part of the, the fills in your Corel. Um, these boxes, I've stitched out these boxes. These boxes were one of the effects I did in one of the hearts. This is all the rage now. This sign right here, this sort of Arabic symbol. One of the other effects I did was these circles, I call them donuts, but I offset them by 50%, and that's how I came up with this little S shape. And it's just fabulous what different effects you can do to fill in a certain area to get the effect that you want. Okay, so that didn't take you too long to, to see some inspiration. Let me go back to the PowerPoint. I'll check one more time for questions. I'm not seeing any questions here, so let me go back to the PowerPoint, and so let's go in. All right, this is what we're going to need to do in order to complete this. You're going to hoop your stabilizer, and then you're going to lay your batting and fabric on top and baste it into place using the basting function. Then you're going to stitch the designs using the colors as desired. Okay, pretty easy. No, you're going to stitch out, you can either stitch out four different hearts, if you get crazy like me and go, okay, what else can I do? What else can I do? Or four of a kind. Now, what I did with um, the red ones is I turned the heart on point before I created my stippling around it so that all my hearts then become two points so that when I piece it together, I can have them all going to the center, all going out. Okay, at that point, you're going to trim each block to nine and a half. So remember that last center line. Uh, outline that we did, you're going to trim a fourth of an inch beyond that. You're going to use a quarter of an inch foot, whether it's the AccuFeed Flex foot quarter inch or the regular quarter inch, you're going to sew all four blocks together into a four patch and then you're going to press the seams open and do a really good press with it because you've got batting, you've got stabilizer, you've got your um, fabric. The way I like to press it, I don't know if you guys don't have a press, the press is awesome, and I'll show you a little bit about the press later on. It is the way to do it. So after I got these four patch put together, I then am going to put on my cording foot, and it has three little tunnels that your cording thread will fit into. Once you've got it all set up, I love using this satin stitch right here. It's sort of a pyramid or whatever. These little zigzags will stitch right over your cording and hold it into place. Beautiful effect. Like I said, I'm one I like to do a lot of dimension to my project. So you're going to stitch that down and I do that right over the seams. That way I'm not a quilter, so my points don't, my center might have been slightly off, but when I couch something over the top of it, it goes away. Nobody knows. You wouldn't have known unless I told you. All right. So the flange. When um, I did the flange, I cut a strip of four inches by the width of my fabric, and I basically created my own striped fabric. I used different kinds of stitches, and I put in different colors on all four of them. They were all four completely different. Then I cut them into a three and a half inch block. So I trimmed everything down to three and a half inches. So I ended up with a three and a half by three and a half inch block. I sewed six of them together, alternating. Now, I know I had a picture of it somewhere. Okay, I there we go. So I stitched them all together, alternating the direction of the stripe. Okay? All right, let me see what else. Okay. <laughs> you do have to create sort of a half square triangle in the corners just so that the sequence goes right. And as you lay it out, what I did is I laid out my top, and then I laid out my blocks along the side and realized you probably wouldn't have to, but it's sort of the way I am. 
All right. Okay. So once I have it now, the 15,000 is uh, has a variable with the zigzag. And I always thought that I wanted to have to move my needle lift or my foot lift, my knee lift, the least amount I could in order to get my effect. I found that when I was doing this, I wanted it to the most movement so that I could find the increments between the narrowest and the widest. And once you start playing with it, you'll go, oh, this could be really fun for applique because it has a motion to it. It's not stagnant. It's not the same width over and over and over. So you're going to find it into applications. You're going to go to quilting. And then you're going to go to variable zigzag. One of the features I have asked for and they have given it to us is to set the maximum width. So I didn't want this to go clear up to the 9 millimeter wide that it could, but I wanted to keep it at a 5 millimeter width. Again, it's all about proportion. And I was going to do my variable width zigzag right in between each block, right on that seam line. So I wanted it to be there, but I didn't want it to be in your face there. All right. So you're going to just stitch a variable width zigzag down each seam between each block. It's just that easy. I think I just did one color all the way around. So it really has a nice continuity, but it has a nice finish to it. All right. So then you're going to sew the borders onto the four block, four patch of the hearts. And then you, you're going to need to finish off the seams where you join the borders together in the corners. So you're going to do your corners, and then you might have to switch back to variable width zigzag in order to get all your seams on your flange accented by your variable width zigzag. Your pillow back, you're just going to piece the pillow back together. You're going to insert a center zipper into the seam in the back of your um, back back of the pillow. Now, I love to do when I do a center placed seam. I was at something and they um, some event and they said what you do is you set your zigzag up really wide and then you zigzag your zipper into place and it will go over your teeth of your zipper when you set it up wide and open and that way I always had like bumps where my um, where my pins were or my zipper shifted after I removed my pin when you zigzag over your zipper it's not moving and that's what I really liked about it was that it was secure and stable until I ripped it out. So you're going to insert your zipper and then you're going to do a layer. You're going to have your back, you're going to have your right sides together for your back and front. Then I added another layer of batting just so that my flange had a batting in it so that it actually would stand up and have some body to it because otherwise there wasn't anything in the flange. So I added another layer of batting and then I sewed the back to the front, right sides together. Make sure you leave your zipper open or you're not going to be able to turn it. All right, let's see. I think the beading. Again, one more little step. I had some beading trim. So I put on the wide beading foot and the mono monofilament thread. You go into applications and at the bottom of the applications window there is a foot with a plus on it. That is going to give you your settings for your optional feet. So you're going to choose your beading foot. There's going to be a pin tuck foot and a couple of other feet in there. You're going to select your beading foot that will automatically set up your settings and then you're just going to sew the beads through all layers of the pillow around the seam where the flange sews to the to the four patch. That is what's going to create your flange is because you're going to sew all the layers together right there so that when you put in your um, pillow form it doesn't go into the corners it stays where you want it to go. All right that is the end of my project. When you're done you're going to have a wonderful four patch um, pillow. This is what I did done in red and they were all set on point. So you can see I really like the, the pearls on a string, but you will see other effects in through there of the things that I just did through that same process that we did today. All right, let's talk about, oh, 
We just got done with our big convention that we have every two years, and we have so many surprises waiting, you guys. So make sure you keep in touch with your local Janome dealer because these surprises are coming hit, hit, coming their way. I don't want to be gender here. They're coming hit the, their way soon. So you guys will be so excited about what we're coming out with. Let's see what else. Oh, I talked about the artistic press. Great for blocks. You know how you've got those corners or those points where you've got all those seams coming together? I can never get it flat until I take it to my press. So ask for a demo if you don't have one. Talk it up if you do. Everybody will want one. All right, AccuDesign app. If you have the 15,000, make sure you get the AccuDesign. Actually, we I just got through giving a class on it. For any embroidery machine, any, your dealer will help you get the designs. This app is for you. Ask him all about it and why you should have it, and he should be able to tell you everything that you need to know. All right, make sure you keep up on Artistic Simple Cuts. We've got some great projects, and we've got instructional videos available at the Artistic YouTube channel. Helps you get going with what you want to do with it. We've got some new artistic edge accessories. We've got a grinder and an etcher and a creaser and a punch hole, a puncher and a pin holder. All sorts of creativity, not just for fabric, for, but for almost any material out there that will lay flat. All right. If you are into quilting, the sit down. I'm not a quilter, but I love this sit down version. It now comes in a forward facing or a sideways facing, depending on how you like to be set up. So ask for a demo on the artistic sit-down version. And that's it. Corral my heart into digitizing. So you're going to be, what we did is just used Corral to give details to designs. And I want to thank you for attending. I'm going to double check. I see one message coming up. Let's see. Okay, and it asks if the Bezier tool's not activated. Really needs to be there for rounding edges on map. Um, we, Laura, the Vizier tool is, yes? Uh, there was one message above that. Yes, that's what I was reading. Okay. Okay. The Vizier tool is a hand drawing tool. So you would use it if you were hand drawing or creating an original um, shape because I was using the smart shape of the heart. I really didn't need it to go around it. Um, but the Bizier tool, uh, in my understanding, is for um, when I'm, I'm drawing a line myself. I was using existing lines. I created my oval and the heart by doing the smart shapes, and I didn't manually draw it. Um, so I hope that answered that question there. Uh, other than that, I think we are completed today. I want to thank everybody who attended. And I want to thank everybody who will watch this as it's archived in the files. Thank you.